Hi, I'm Reverend Greg and I welcome you to this video in the tutorial series Shaders for Hobby Programmers. In the last video we created this basic Luma Mask shader and for that version to work properly we have both the base sprite as well as the mask sprite on a separate texture page each and both had to be of the same size and aspect ratio. In this video we're going to lift those restrictions with two different methods. The first method is remapping the UVs of the base sprite to the mask. The second method is a bit easier in maths but a bit more complicated to implement. We're going to create our own vertex buffer and send the mask UVs into the shader as a vertex attribute. Pretty much the same TMS already does with the attribute in texture chord for the base sprite. But as always, short disclaimer first. This tutorial series is mainly for hobby programmers who struggle with understanding shaders. I'm not a professional programmer and I'm not very good at maths, so if you see any mistake in my video or see a better way to solve a problem, please add a comment so everyone can learn from you. So let's identify the problem and talk about remapping the UVs. In the last video we had the base sprite and the mask each on a separate texture page and both were filling up their page. Therefore their UV coordinates both range from 0, 0 to 1, 1 like seen here. When we're drawing the base sprite, GameMaker Studio sends the UV coordinates of all four vertices on the texture page of the base sprite as the vertex attribute in texture code into the vertex shader. The vertex shader then sends UVs interpolated for each fragment to the fragment shader by setting the varying VB text code to the vertex attribute in texture code. So in example, the pixel or fragment in the middle left will receive the coordinates U0 and V0.5 and the fragment at the bottom center will receive the coordinates U0.5 and V1. This is one of the core mechanics of the vertex shader. All varying we create from vertex attributes are interpolated for every fragment when they reach the fragment shader. The same in example happens with the varying VV color since it is set to the vertex attribute in color. To get the sample from the base sprite, we usually tell the fragment shader to pick the sample at the interpolated UV coordinate VV text code. However, for this dissolve shader, we also needed to take a sample from the second texture, the Luma mask. And that was easy in the previous video because the masks had the same UVs and so we were able to just reuse VV text code to take a sample from the mask texture as well. But of course we could instead also create a separate varying for the mask's UV coordinates inside the vertex shader. If we in example create a new varying called VV mask code and set it to VV text code like in this example, we'd send a second set of interpolated UV coordinates to the fragment shader. The coordinates would be exactly the same as VV text code, but we're going to change that in a bit. And inside the fragment shader we could then take a sample from the mask texture at VV mask code instead of a VV text code. But what if the base and the mask do not share the same UVs? In example, what if they're both on the same texture page like in this example? We then can't use the same UVs to take a sample from the mask because like this our dissolve shader would use the base sprite as a mask instead of the luma mask because we're picking the mask sample exactly where we're picking the base sprite sample. Or what if the base and the mask are on different texture pages but not at the same place there? Again the UVs would be wrong and the result would look like this. Instead of the mask, parts of the Tatooine photo would be used to mask the base sprite because on the mask's texture page, that photo is at the UVs of the base sprite. So in this example, we need to shift the UV coordinates of the base sprite a bit up and right to get to the correct mask's texture chords. And we'll do this by calculating the transformation in GML and then passing a transformation vector to the shader as a uniform vec2 for the X shift and Y shift. So inside the vertex shader, I'm going to create a vec2 uniform called mask transform. And in the main function, I'll now set VV mask code to VV text code plus the transformation vector. Like this, VV mask code will be a coordinate system based on the vertex coordinate of the base sprite, but shifted by the transformation vector. This means in create event, we'll need to calculate the shift amount along the U and V axis so we can pass that into the shader later. And that's pretty simple for now. The X shift is the mask's left U coordinate minus the base sprite's left U coordinate. 
So in this example, that would be 0 minus 0 0.5 equals negative 0 0.5. And the Y shift is pretty much the same. The mask's top V coordinate minus the base bright's top V coordinate. So 0 0.3 minus 0 0.5 equals negative 0 0.2. Now the base bright's UVs plus the transformation vector will lead to the mask's UVs. But unfortunately that's not enough. We cannot be sure that the two texture pages have the same size. Although we can set the maximum texture page size within the settings of each target platform in Game Maker Studio, we cannot force the texture page size, just the maximum. So depending on how many sprites and what sprites are in a texture group, the size of the pages might differ. In this example, the base sprite is on a larger texture page than the mask's texture page. Mind that both the base sprite and the mask are equally large still though. But since the UVs of a texture page always range from 0, 0 to 1, 1, the width and height of the mask on the smaller texture page is twice as much in UVs as the base sprite width and height on the larger texture page. The base sprite's width and height are 0.4 and the masks are 0.8. This means if we'd use VVTextCord without shifting the UVs, only the lower right part of the mask would be used. And shifting alone wouldn't fix the problem, after shifting only the top left part would be used. So we also need to scale the coordinates. We'll need an X scale and a Y scale factor. To handle both shift and scale, with one uniform we can change the data type of our transform vector from VEC2 to VEC4. Components X and Y will be the X and Y scale, and the components Z and W will be the X and Y shift. In the vertex shader's main function, we'll then set VV mask chord to VV text chord times mask transform dot X Y to scale plus mask transform dot Z W to shift. The scale factor is easy to get. That's just the mask's width in UVs divided by the base sprite's width in UVs for the scale in the x-axis and the mask's height in UVs divided by the base sprite's height in UVs for the scale in the y-axis. For now, both scales should be the same, but later in the tutorial we'll see that the scale factor might be different for the two axes and so we'll need one scale factor for each. Now since the shifting calculation is in the mask's texture UV space, we need to calculate the scale factor into the shift as well. So shift X now is the mask's left U coordinate minus the scaled sprite left U coordinate and the shift Y is the same with V coordinates. And now this gets kind of complicated, so let's just calculate an example here. First the scale factors. The mask's width in UVs on its texture page is 0.8 and the base sprite's width in UVs on its texture page is 0.4. So the scale on the x-axis is 0.8 divided by 0.4 which is 2. And in this example the scale on the y-axis is the same. Now the shifting. The mask's left U is 0, the base sprite's left U is 0.5 and the scale is 2. So the shift on the x-axis is 0 minus 0.5 times 2 is negative 1. And the mask's top V is 0.1, the base sprite's top V is 0.5 and the scale is 2. So the shift on the y-axis is 0.1 minus 0.5 times 2 is negative 0.9. The transformation vector mask transform built from scale x, scale y, shift x and shift y therefore is 2, 2, negative 1, negative 0.9. In a draw event, we'll pass that vector to the vertex shader and there the mask coordinate system VV mask chord is calculated from the base sprite's coordinates VV text chord and the mask transform vector. So the top left vertex on the mask's texture page will be the base sprite's left U 0.5 times the scale 2 plus the X shift negative 1 which results in 0. And the base sprite's top V 0.5 times the scale 2 plus the Y shift negative 0.9 which results in 0.1. So the top left vertex will be transformed from 0.5 0.5 to 0 0.1. And looking at the UVs of the mask, that's correct. The bottom right vertex works as well. The base sprites write U 0.9 times the scale 2 plus the X shift negative 1 which results in 0.8. 
and the base sprite's bottom V 0.9 times the scale 2 plus the Y shift negative 0.9 which results in 0.9. So the bottom right vertex will be transformed from 0.9, 0.9 to 0.8, 0.9. And looking at the UVs of the mask, that's correct as well. Now let me show the reason why I split the scale into two factors. As mentioned before, we can set the maximum size of Game Maker Studio's texture pages and the texture pages sides always have to be a power of two. However, we cannot control if both sides are the same. This means the texture page can be either square, wide or tall. And we cannot know which it's going to be because those texture pages are created when compiling the game. So aside from having different sizes, the two texture pages could also have different aspect ratios. And the weirdness about this is that although the images in this example both are square, their sides measured in UVs are not. And the base sprite's width in UVs is 0.8 and its height is 0.4, whereas the mask's width is 0.4 and its height is 0.8. This seems to complicate everything, but fortunately by splitting the scale factor into scale X and scale Y, we already solved this problem. Next let me show another situation where this remapping code works nicely. In this example here I shrank the base sprite down by factor 2. But since this code is calculating the scale factor as a relation of the two images UV width and UV height, this will still work. The transformation vector will still transform all of the base sprite's vertex UV coordinates to the mask's UV coordinates. But there's one problem to solve still and it's a tricky one. What if the base sprite and the mask are not the same shape? In this example I changed the base sprite to a sprite with a wider aspect. The mask would be stretched to fill the base sprite. And I usually don't like stretched images, even if it's just a mask that's being stretched. So we need to change the scale and shift a bit to make the mask cover the base sprite without stretching. But since it's a bit complicated, I'll start at the beginning with a transformation vector 1100. If we just project the base sprite's UVs onto the mask texture page, the UVs would describe an extremely wide rectangle. That's simply due to the differently shaped texture pages. This area would then be used as mask and would be stretched to fit the base sprite like this. Implementing the same scale calculation as before, the remarked UVs would be the size of the mask, but way off the texture page. Shifting brings us to where we were before already. The remapped UVs now fit the mask and thus the mask is stretched to fit the base sprite. To fix this, we need to change scale and shift a bit. But the fix is different depending on relation of the aspect ratios of the base sprite and the mask. If the sprite is wider than the mask, as it is in this example, we'll need to change the y-axis only. But if the mask would be wider, we'd only need to change the x-axis. This means we'll need an if statement. And we'll need to move the shifting calculation into the if blocks because those depend on the scale factor. I can't really explain this line of code to fix the Y scale factor. I just knew I need to work with the aspect ratios in pixels instead of UVs, but the rest was trial and error. But what we're basically doing here is dividing the Y scale by the relation of the base sprite aspect ratio to the mask aspect ratio in pixels. This will narrow the result as you can see, and thus the result will be unstretched. But now the shift is a bit off. I don't want to get the upper part of the mask, I want to get the middle section. So we'll also need to fix the shifting now. This is rather easy again. We can just add half of the difference in height of the base sprite and mask. We just need to make sure the base sprite's height is in UV space of the mask texture page and thus need to factor the scale in. And with this, the result is what I wanted it to be. A centered mask covering the base sprite, but instead of being stretched to fit, it's now scaled and cropped to fit. And if the base sprite's aspect ratio is not larger than the mask's, we'll just need to fix the scale and shift along the x-axis instead, and the code is pretty much the same though. Now it's finally time to switch to Game Maker Studio and get this working for real. I'm building this upon the assets we created in the last video. So let's just duplicate the object from then. It was called Object Luma Mask 1 Tags. 
and name the duplicate object Luma Mask Mixed Text Remapped UVs. Then we can place it on the main layer of our test room. Next we'll need four texture groups just for testing purposes. So under Tools, Texture Groups, I'm creating four groups called Luma Mask White 1, Y2, Tall 1, and Tall 2. We need to make sure the auto cropping is turned off, or the remap code would need to be a lot more complicated. And we will need some filler sprites for those texture groups to force Game Maker Studio to create some wide or narrow texture pages. You'll see what I mean soon. So let's create four sprites. Sprite filler wide 1 will be on the texture page wide 1, and I'll set its dimensions to 1010. Sprite filler wide 2 will be on the texture page wide 2, and I'll set its dimensions to 2010. Sprite filler tall 1 will be on the texture page tall 1, and I'll set its dimensions to 10 and 1000. And sprite filler tall 2 will be on the texture page tall 2, and I'll set its dimensions to 2010. Now we'll also need some base sprites and mask sprites. I already imported three base sprites. The square base sprite on a separate texture page is what we used in the last video. And this time we're going to use the portrait and landscape shaped base sprites. I'm assigning the texture group wide 1 to the portrait sprite and texture group tall 2 to the landscape sprite. But you can actually combine them however you want since the code should work anyways. And I'm creating two duplicates of the cross mask here. Name them sprite mask cross 1 and 2. Make sure they're not on a separate texture page. And then assign them to the two remaining texture groups, wide 2 and tall 1. Now the shader will be nearly the same as in the last video as well. So let's just create a duplicate of shader luma mask 1 text and name the duplicate shader luma mask mixed text remapped UVs. And to remap the UVs, I will use a script. So let's create an empty script for now and name it script create remap vector stretched to fit. That's it for the preparations. Now let's move to the object's events. In create event, I'm quickly changing the info text. Shader will be the duplicate we just created. Sprite will be either the portrait or landscape based sprite we've seen earlier. And mask will be one of the cross masks we duplicated earlier as well. But in this code we won't need mask to be an instance variable, so I'll just change it to be a local variable. We'll still need to get the mask's texture ID and a uniform handle, but we'll now also need a mask transform vector and a uniform handle for that. To create the transform vector, we'll use the script we created earlier. The script will need the IDs of both the base sprite and the mask, and will return an array with scale x, scale y, shift x, and shift y. Before that, let's continue with the object. The rest of the create event can stay as it is. We will still need the remaining uniforms, and we can leave the GUI code in here as well. The step event won't change at all, that was just used to set the slider automation speed. And the only thing we need to change in draw event is setting the mask transform uniform. Since the remap script will return an array, we can use shader set uniform f array. Now to the remapping script. First we'll need the base sprite UVs and the width and height in UVs instead of pixels. And then the same for the mask. And 
And now we can calculate the scale and shift amounts. So scale X is the mask UV width divided by the base sprite's UV width. And scale Y is the mask's UV height divided by the base sprite's UV height. Shift X is the difference of the mask's left U and the base sprite's left U in the mask's UV space. And shift Y is the difference of the mask's top V and the base sprite's top V in the mask's UV space as well. And now we can just return all four components. The last thing to do before our first run is adding the transform vector to the shader code. In the vertex shader, add a new varying vec2 VV mask chord and a uniform vec4 mask transform. And inside the main function will set VV mask chord to VV text chord times mask transform dot xy to apply the scale and plus mask transform dot zw to apply the shift. Inside the fragment shader we'll grab the new varying and make sure the variable mask val now takes a sample at VV mask chord instead of VV text chord. And I just realized the sprite filler tall 2 is wide instead of tall, so let me quickly fix this. Now let's run this in debug mode and check if the remapping works. Everything looks as expected. The UVs are remapped and the mask is stretched to fit the base sprite for now. Now let's pause the game and check the texture pages in the graphics tab of the debugger. Here we can see the four new texture pages with their different sizes and shapes. You can see the two masks and the base sprites are on different texture pages, but the code works anyways. Now we'll need to scale to fit without stretching. So let's duplicate the remapping script, name the duplicate script create remap vector scaled to fit, and set it in create event. We'll now also need the aspects of the base sprite and the mask sprite based on the width and height in pixels, not UVs. And we'll need to add the if statement to check if the base sprite's aspect is larger than the mask's aspect. If it is, we'll need to fix scale Y and shift Y and if not, we'll need to fix scale X and shift X. The basic scale calculation can stay the same, but the basic shift calculation needs to be inside the if statement because we need to fix the scale factor first. And now we can fix the scale Y and shift Y if the base bright's aspect is larger. and the scale X and shift X if not. Mind that to fix the scale Y, we need to divide scale Y by the relation of sprite aspect to mask aspect, and to fix scale X, we need to multiply. Now let's run this again and see if everything works still. Looks like it does, the mask isn't stretched anymore, but just to be sure, I'm going to change the sprite and mask in the object's create event and rerun to check if that works as well. And as you can see, it does. But now let's have a look at a different way to get interpolated texture coordinates for the mask texture. We already established that GameMaker Studio sends vertex data with each vertex to the vertex shader. In GLS Alias, those are called attributes. In this tutorial series, we already used and manipulated all of them. In example, the vertex attribute in position. It's a vec3 describing where in the game room the vertex is with an x, y, and z component. We use this in the Stance Code Shader tutorial, and we could also use this to distort a 2D or 3D mesh. Then there's the vertex attribute in color. It's a VEC4 with RGBA color information and can be used to change the image's color. And by setting the varying vector color to the attribute in color, we'll get an interpolated color inside the fragment shader. 
Usually TMS multiplies this with the sample color, but we could write our own blend mode in the fragment shader. And finally, there's the vertex attribute in texture chord. A vector describing where on the texture page this vertex is. By setting the varying vector text chord to in texture chord, we get a coordinate on the texture page to take a sample from for the base sprite. In the first part of this video, we used the texture coordinate and the transformation vector to get to the texture coordinates for the mask sprite. But we could actually just create a new vertex attribute similar to in texture chord and send the UVs of the mask on its texture page to this attribute. Then we could build an interpolated coordinate from that attribute instead of remapping. To add an attribute, we'll need a vertex buffer, so let's have a quick glance at those as well. When we draw a sprite with the usual draw functions, GMS automatically creates a vertex buffer kinda like this. The buffer is defined to hold information on its room position, RGBA color and texture UV coordinate. I think it's also storing a Z position, but I'll just ignore that here. And then the buffer is built. The buffer is basically space in memory and it will be filled in a very specific order. It's being filled attribute by attribute, vertex by vertex. So GameMaker Studio will start with vertex 0 and write position X, position Y, red, green, blue, alpha, U and V into the buffer. Then TMS will continue with vertex 1, vertex 2 and finally vertex 3. But TMS also lets us create our own vertex buffer. To do so we first need to define the format of the buffer. In our case, that will be the position in the room, the UV coordinates of the base sprite, and the UV coordinates of the mask. We're ditching the vertex color though, because we won't need it. After defining the buffer format, we're going to manually build the buffer by setting all those attributes. We'll need to set the position attribute of vertex 0, then the base sprite UVs, then the mask UVs. And then we will repeat the process for vertex 1, as well as vertices 2 and 3. This feels kinda tedious, but with a simple script it's going to be a bit easier. Defining the buffer and building it will be done in create event, because in our example the room position and texture coordinates won't ever change. So there's no need to rebuild the buffer every frame. We can and will even completely freeze the buffer, which makes it unchangeable, but more performant. Then in draw event, instead of calling the function draw sprite, we will submit the vertex buffer to the GPU and we'll need to tell how the vertices are connected. There's different ways to connect vertices, but I'm just showing two as an example here. The first is a triangle list. Each triangle needs three vertices and thus a quad created from two triangles has six vertices. The other one, and that's the one I'm going to use in my example, is a triangle strip. These triangles always share one side and thus two vertices. And this means a quad made from two triangles only need four vertices. With this we got all we need to code this. So let's switch to TMS once more. Like with the remapping we just did, I'm going to base this shader on the result of the last video. So let's start by duplicating object luma mask one text and renaming the duplicate to object luma mask mixed text attribute UVs. Let's place the object on the main layer of our test room. Then I'll duplicate the shader from the last video, Shader Luma Mask 1 text, and rename it to Shader Luma Mask Mixed Text Attribute UVs. And we will need a new script called Script Add Vertex PTT. PTT for Position, Texture Coordinate, Texture Coordinate. Let's start with the object again. In create event, as always, I'll start by adding the info text for this test module. Then I'll set the new shader which is created. As sprite, I'm picking one of the mockup menus, the landscape this time, but any will do. Now to submit our buffer later in draw event, we'll need the base sprite's texture ID, 
and to build the buffer we'll need the base sprites UVs. The UVs can be stored in local var, we'll only need those in create event to pass them to the buffer. As mask I'm gonna pick one of the cross mask sprites as before and get its UVs as well. We'll still need the mask's texture ID and a uniform handle for that texture ID. Of course we'll also still need the handles for time, tolerance and inverse and we can leave the GUI code as it is as well. Now we'll need to create the vertex buffer and I want a separate code region for that. Inside the region we need to start by defining a vertex format. I don't understand why this was not implemented in a more comfortable way, but what we need to do is tell TMS we're beginning to define a vertex format calling the function vertex format begin. Then add each attribute, in our case a position attribute and two texture coordinate attributes with the functions vertex format add position or add text chord. And then we need to tell GMS we're done defining the format with the function vertex format end and store the return value in a variable which I called vformat. To set the vertex buffer's position, I'll need to know the width and height of the base sprite, or actually rather half of that. So I'm storing those values in local variables. And then we can finally build the buffer. First, we'll need to create a buffer by calling the function vertex create buffer and store its reference in a variable which I called vbuffer. And then we can tell GMS we're beginning to build the buffer with the function vertex begin. This function takes two variables, the buffer and the vertex buffer format. So vbuffer and vformat. We'll build it in a sec. I'll first want to tell GMS we're done building the buffer and then to freeze the buffer. Freezing the buffer means we can't change it anymore, but in our case we won't have to. The upside is that a frozen buffer can be submitted to the GPU a bit faster though. Now the buffer building. We're going to add all vertex attributes for all vertices. But to make that more readable, we're going to use the script script add vertex PTT we created earlier. So let's code that script. We'll need several arguments. The buffer the vertex's room position x and y, the vertex's texture u and v for the base sprite, and the vertex's texture u and v for the mask. To set the vertex attribute, we'll need the functions vertex position and vertex text chord. Both need to know which vertex buffer to write to. That's argument zero. And since both text chords are two dimensional, both take two values x and y or u and v. It's very important to add those three lines in the exact same order as we defined the vertex buffer format. So position first and then two texture coordinates. Now back in create event we can finally build the buffer. The top left vertex gets the left x and top y position in the game room and the left u and top v of the base sprite and the left u and top v of the mask. Seems like I forgot to define mask UVs as local var. We won't need it after the create event anymore. And the other vertices follow the same pattern of course. Position, sprite, UV, mask UV for top right, bottom left and bottom right vertices. The order of those corners matter by the way. They absolutely always have to be a zigzag line because we're going to submit a triangle strip to save vertices. So you can't go top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left. Because that would be clockwise and not zigzag. And that's it for the create event for now. The step event again can stay as it is. And in draw event all we need to do is replace draw sprite with vertex submit. This function takes three arguments. Of course it needs to know which buffer to submit. So v buffer in our example. It needs to know how the vertices are connected and since we zigzag we set this to triangle strip and we will need to tell which texture to draw and this of course is the texture the base sprite is on. Seems like I made another mistake here, I wrote sprite text instead of sprite text in create event. 
once we leave this room, we won't need the buffer format and the buffer anymore. So to prevent a memory leak, I'll delete both in room end event. Next, we'll need to write the shader. We already duplicated the shader from the last video, so let's open shader luma mask mixed text attribute UVs. In the vertex shader, we need to change the vertex attributes to our vertex format. We can keep in position. Although we submitted only an X and a Y component, it's still a VEC3. I think GMS just sets automatically a Z component for us. We won't need the attribute in color since we didn't include that in our vertex buffer. Now here's something I don't quite understand. How are the attributes we had set in our buffer linked to the attributes in the vertex shader? I know for sure it's not just the order of our vertex format, at least not on Windows. I tested that and depending on platform, the order was respected or ignored. So if we just define a VEC3 in position, VEC2 in text code and in example VEC2 mask code, the shader might mix up the two sets of texture coordinates. Here's what I think is true though. One criteria most likely is the data type. A VEC4 won't be linked to a VEC2. Since in position is the only VEC3, this will be linked correctly. Another criteria is the naming. If there's two attributes of the same data type like our two texture coordinates, the shader will try to order them by name. And I think this is because on Windows we'd usually write in HLSL and set the semantics to link the vertex attributes. But because I'm writing this in GLSL ES and let Game Maker Studio translate, the shader will fall back to just ordering by name. So to be sure, I'll rename this attribute by adding a zero and then add a new attribute with the same name except for a one. We won't need the varying vector color, but we'll need a varying vector mask code as we did in the remapping shader. And inside the main function, we can remove the color line as well and need to set the varying vector text code to the attribute in text accord 0 and the varying vector mask code to the attribute in text accord 1. In the fragment shader, we'll delete the varying vector color as well and add the varying vector mask code. And inside the main function, we'll get the mask val sample from VV mask code. And we'll need to remove a VV caller from the main function as well. But now let's finally run this version for the first time. And we can see this code works as well. The masks UVs are correctly stretched to the base bytes UVs. Now I'd like to add a scale to fit without stretching feature like we had with the remapping technique. But I'm not going to explain the maths in detail this time since the basic idea is very much similar. So let's open a create event and just before the vertex buffer region, I add another region called scale to fit. Again, we'll need to compare the aspect ratio of the sprite and the mask. So I'm going to store both in a local var. Then if the base sprite aspect is greater than the mask aspect, we'll get the mask's height in UVs and the sprite height in mask UVs. Half the difference of those two heights will be used to crop the mask's UVs from the top and from the bottom. And with those areas cropped, the mask won't be stretched or squeezed onto the base sprite anymore. With this done, we can run another test and see a nicely scaled mask without stretching. So again, if you want to, you could test other base sprites and masks of different sizes and different shaped texture pages. And hopefully the code will work still as well. 
That's it for this video. As you can imagine, remapping the UVs or using the vertex buffer to send other vertex data into the shader can be very, very important in many shader effects, not just for Luma masks. I really hope this was helpful and I very much hope the remapping really works with all kinds of sprites. I think it should and I test it a lot, but I'm not 100% sure it does. Next time we're going to build upon today's video and add a two colored rim to the Luma mask and the video after we'll add a colored ramp texture. Until next time.